Good morning. My name is Ellen McFarlane, and I'll be leading today's service. Reverend Matt Allspa will be presenting our message this morning. Our opening words this morning are by Paul H. LaRue. We gather in community to rest from our labors, to greet our neighbors, and to open our being to insight and intuition of that greater reality of which we are a part. May we find in our time together inspiration and renewal. May we touch the holy in each other and be touched by the graciousness of life. May we find here a calm peacefulness that will carry us through the days ahead. Amen. And so, I just want to welcome you with live from LCUUF Sunday service. <clears throat> Our announcements were on a slideshow before the service. They were also emailed yesterday with the order of service. And now, a special welcome to our visitors. If you are visiting with us for the first time, or have returned or reconnected with us after a long absence, we invite you to say your name and tell us where you're from. Use the Zoom raise hand feature, or just turn your video on and wave your hand, and we'll ask you to unmute. I don't see anyone. Our chalice lighting words today are by Julianne Lepp. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. Now let us light our chalice with these words that we sing together. Our hymn is Find a Stillness. Each week, we take time to remind ourselves that we belong to a community which cares for each other. We do this by sharing any significant joys or sorrows in our lives. 
If you have a joy or sorrow to share today, you can type it into the chat now, and we'll read those aloud. First, let us voice our sorrows or concerns. Whatever you or the world may be holding that is in need of our healing and caring thoughts, you are welcome to type sorrows into the chat box. Are there any sorrows to be shared on Zoom? From Carol Johnson, please light a candle of concern for my dear friend Elena, who's facing some serious health problems. And from Devorah, my 98-year-old mother was diagnosed with COVID on Monday and was fit to be tied that she had to stay in her apartment for five days. Luckily, she had a mild case. And then from uh, Liz Mulder, a, con a concern for that Russia does not invade the Ukraine. And then finally, from Colleen Berry, uh, a sorrow, please light a candle for my friend Loretta Evans, who passed away Friday. I enjoyed working with her for many years. And that's it. Now let us recall the joys. Whatever you may be celebrating, whatever evokes a feeling of joy or peace for yourself or others, you are welcome to type joys in the chat box. Are there any joys to be shared on Zoom? Not today. Oh. There. And this candle from our care team represents those sorrows that are too raw, too difficult for us to share aloud. So many of us have had losses, partners, children, grandchildren, losses that remain present with us every day. So many of us have burdens, anger, fear, frustration, all of these things that weigh heavy on our hearts. We light this candle for all those unspoken sorrows. Good morning. This meditation is from Josh Korda, who is a Buddhist teacher. And it's an a meditation that invites us into an exploration of spacious awareness. So I want to invite you, if you are willing, to close your eyes or soften your eyes. That is to say, just find maybe a spot on the floor to look at and just sort of Soften your eyes so that you're not really staring or anything like that. And just start by noticing your breath. Just noticing the in-breath and the out-breath. So wherever in your body it's easiest to notice the breath. And while in most meditations we'll focus on some specific thing, we're going to focus today on a lot of different things to be aware of uh, all of how... And um, we'll start with sounds around us. And we'll notice the sounds. Trying not to visualize what is making the sound, but rather just the sound itself. Just noticing the sound. For some people, it may be easier to uh, pay attention with which direction the sound is coming from, maybe to the left working through the center and over to the right, kind of noticing a sound field around us. Again, not trying to want or resist the sounds, you know, maybe the freeway sounds or the highway sounds outside or whatever, 
not trying to identify the sounds, but just noticing. So we'll do that for a moment or two. And if your mind drifts away, just come back to the sounds or to the breathing. And now we might bring our attention also, in addition to those, the sound and the breathing, to the feeling of contact with the chair or the cushion, whatever we're sitting on, that feeling of connection with the earth. You might just notice where your mind believes there is a division between your body and that object that you are in contact with. Just notice the feeling of that contact, the pressure, perhaps. You might notice the feeling of your body in contact with other things, like, for example, your clothes, the weight of clothes on your shoulders, perhaps, or the pressure of your clothes against your body. Just notice those feelings. And you might add into all this with the sounds and the breathing and the feeling of contact, any feeling of body sensations. Maybe you've got aches, you've got noticings, itches, whatever. Just notice them. You don't have to try to analyze them, just feel them. And now notice the state of your mind. Maybe you're very aware, trying to stay on top of all of these things that we've introduced into our awareness, the noticing of the breath and the sounds and the contact feelings, body sensations. But even so, your mind still may be jumpy, looking for other things to think about, or it might be settled and at a degree of awakened peace. You may notice how thoughts come or go in your mind, even during a meditation like this. For many of us, thoughts appear sort of visually, as if on a screen in our mind, maybe at our forehead or behind our eyes. It's probably easier to notice if your eyes are closed, but just notice it if it occurs. For others of us, at times, thoughts come up as verbal chatter in the mind, the monkey mind. Just notice those words coming up, our little messages to ourselves. Just step back and notice them with awareness. And so we've given our mind a lot of things to think about here, breathing, sounds in the background, that sound field, the sensation of contact with the earth and other sensations on our body, our thoughts in our mind, whether they're visual or auditory. We're inviting our mind to really be aware right now. And here's where this meditation gets kind of powerful. Because typically we notice when we're thinking about these kinds of things, whether they are inside or outside of our body. But what if we thought of it all as in our mind? All of these awarenesses are things in our mind. So we might notice those sounds and just sort of let go of the, the sense that we have a, a, a skull or a cerebrum that separates us from the world and just let those sounds sort of exist in our mind. Maybe we expand our mind to hold them. And the breathing as well. And now with the contact with the earth, with our cushion, just sort of 
allow that to sort of buzz out a little bit. Don't worry about the division between the body and the rest of the world and our clothes and all that. Just sort of feel that looseness of connection. Just sort of allow the body to spread out. Remove the inner and outer. Ultimately, we just let go of what is mine and what is not mine and just allow it to all be a kind of loose, fuzzy reality. Just notice all that's occurring without that body outline, all in the mind. And we'll just sit here for a little while longer being in awareness of all that is. And returning now to this space and time to be together with each other. Today's first reading consists of several quotes from Albert Einstein. From a letter in 1914, nature shows us only the tail of the lion, but there is no doubt in my mind that the lion belongs with it, even if he cannot reveal himself to the eye all at once because of his huge dimension. We see him only the way a louse sitting upon him would. From a letter in 1918, the physical world is real. That is supposed to be the fundamental hypothesis. The above statement appears to me, however, to be in itself meaningless, as if one said the physical world is cock-a-doodle-doo. It appears to me that the real is an intrinsically empty, meaningless category, a pigeonhole, whose monstrous importance lies only in the fact that I can do certain things in it and not certain things. From autobiographical notes in 1949, a wonder. I experienced as a child of four or five years when my father showed me a compass that this needle behaved in such a determined way did not at all fit into the nature of events. I can still remember, or at least believe I can remember, that this experience made a deep and lasting impression upon me. Something deeply hidden had to be behind things. A couple of months ago, when the Sunday Service Committee was planning services for February, we put up the Sunday Service Calendar spreadsheet and began to review the Sunday speakers and topics. Somebody said, Matt, you've got February 20th, but the topic is empty. What are you going to talk about? And in an impish moment, I said, how about emptiness? And here I am. I had little awareness how complex a topic like emptiness could be. One interpretation of emptiness is in Buddhism, and to some degree, Hinduism is as a way to understand reality. So what is reality? Rather than starting with an Eastern religious viewpoint, I thought I might start with a physicalist point of view that might be more comfortable for many of you out there. Yes, I'm talking to you, you humanists. 
I thought we might start with a view of reality, of physics. But even here, we must be careful. I warn you, I am not a physicist. So take my commentary with a degree of suspicion. But I don't have to tell you that. Most of you already do take me with a degree of suspicion. So what is reality? It could be so much cock a doodle do as Einstein warned us. He went on to warn us that what is rea real is intrinsically empty and meaningless. So maybe we should tread carefully. But let's tread on. It's easy to look around us and see reality, numerous objects around us, t uh, tables, chairs, computers, things that seem obviously real and separate from each other. But what is that reality? Well, most, as most of us are aware, these objects are made up with, of tiny constituents called atoms, particles that somehow link together to form the objects and give them structure. And most of us know that atoms are themselves made up of a tiny nucleus surrounded by electrons. If we live through the nuclear age, as most of us did, we're very familiar with this sketch of an atom with the nucleus surrounded by electrons orbiting it. This sketch gets some things right. For example, that atoms are mostly empty space. But it is wrong in some ways. For example, it shows the electrons as little particles whizzing around like satellites in orbit. And it's not quite like that. A more accurate way to visualize the atoms is with the electrons not drawn as individual particles in orbits, but rather to just show the places where the electrons are likely to be. These, oops, these subshells shown in this diagram. Now, I remember I learned about this in high school chemistry. I had a very good chemistry class. I was stunned to learn, however, that these shells represented only the most likely places that the electrons could be. The electrons could be anywhere. It's not confined to these regions. An electron could be momentarily on the moon, though that would be exceedingly rare. In reality, though, the electrons stay within those shells most of the time. And what are the nucleus? We imagine it being made of protons and neutrons, again, as little balls. Again, this model only goes so far. Our current understanding is that the protons and neutrons are themselves each made of three particles called quarks. But of course, it's more complex than just three quarks hanging out there. It's a whole hot mess of virtual particles, quarks and antiquarks and gluons popping in and out of existence inside the nucleus inside the atom. It's a roiling, stormy sea of activity in there of particles arising and disappearing. But all this discussion of particles leaves out a more fundamental awareness of the physical reality. That is the wave nature of reality. You see, underlying all we see are waves traversing fields in space. This is quantum field theory. And it's extremely hard to visualize, but we try. This visualization is from Alessandro Roussel, a mathematical physicist. And it gives a good sense of these fields and how these fields might look like. This image depicts two particles interacting, becoming a third particle. You might find his science click videos on YouTube compelling. I did. Basically, these fields, and there are a handful of them, fill out our three-dimensional space. Waves can travel through these fields somewhat like sound waves traveling through air. But because these fields are quantized, only certain discrete levels of energy can appear. What we like to think of as particles are, in fact, these energy levels. On top of these, these various fields can interact with each other, which we see as particles interacting, being created, being destroyed. When we visualize the world this way, we find, for example, the nucleus of the atom is a very active place with fields moving, 
vibrating, exchanging energy like waves on a frothy, stormy sea. And what's more, even empty space is not tranquil. The fields there are moving and interacting. Maybe not so stormy, maybe more like a slightly choppy sea. A version of quantum field theory that we now know as the standard model has been extremely successful in accurately explaining just about everything we see in particle physics experiments, even including the Large Hadron Collider in Europe. This is a picture of just a tiny part of it. But even though quantum field theory is remarkably accurate in describing parts of reality, it's not complete. There must be a deeper understanding of reality to consider. And this is because of Einstein. You see, quantum field theory doesn't take gravity into account, more specifically Einstein's general relativity. Like quantum field theory, Einstein's general relativity is remarkably accurate in describing reality. In this case, a, an image of space-time collapsing around some strong mass. And these different parts of reality just don't work, play well together. We have two truths about reality, and they don't work well together. So we don't yet have a deep and full understanding of physical reality. We are, as Einstein suggested, sitting on the tail of the lion, not seeing the whole creature, but only a tiny bit of the whole. And yet we yearn. We are called to see more, to understand reality more fully. Like Einstein as a child with his compass, we still face something deeply hidden behind themes, things. And we want to plumb those depths to understand this reality. This reading is the Heart Sutra, which is quite central to Mahayana Buddhism, one of the three main branches of Buddhism. In this text, Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion, is explaining to Sariputra, a monk, about concepts of enlightenment. It begins, Avalokiteshvara, who helps all to awaken, moves in the deep course of realizing wisdom beyond wisdom, sees that all five streams of body and mind are boundless, and frees all from anguish. O oh, Sariputra, form is not separate from boundlessness. Boundlessness is not separate from form. Form is boundlessness. Boundlessness is form. Feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and discernment are also like this. O Sariputra, boundlessness is the nature of all things. It neither arises nor perishes, neither stains nor purifies, neither increases nor decreases. Boundlessness is not limited by form, nor by feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and discernment. It is free of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Free of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and any object of mind. Free of sensory realms, including mind consciousness. It is free of ignorance and the end of ignorance. Boundlessness is free of old age and death and free from the end of old age and death. It is free of suffering, arising, sensation, and path and free of wisdom and attainment. Being free of attainment those who help all to awaken abide in the realization of wisdom beyond wisdom and live with an unhindered mind. 
Without hindrance, the mind has no fear. Free from confusion, those who lead all to emancipation embody complete serenity. All those in the past, present, and future who realize wisdom beyond wisdom manifest unsurpassable, authentic, and thorough awakening. Know that realizing wisdom beyond wisdom is no other than this great mantra, luminous, incomparable, and supreme. It relieves all suffering. It is genuine, not illusory. So set forth this mantra of realizing wisdom beyond wisdom. Set forth this mantra that says, gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhi, saha. Okay, I'm sure many of you will be glad now that I'm leaving science behind and delving into a more spiritual realm. And I'm sure that others won't be so glad. Our second reading was a version of the Heart Sutra, an ancient text that is chanted in many Buddhist gatherings. It is very dense and captures many core ideas of Mahayana Buddhism. We're not going to explore it fully today, but I want to note what it says about boundlessness or emptiness. Now, boundlessness is preferred by some over emptiness. The Heart Sutra tells us that to realize some ultimate wisdom beyond wisdom to awaken, we realize that the body and mind are boundless, empty. Let me quote, quote from Roshi Joan Halifax, a Zen Buddhist teacher whom I've studied with. The Heart Sutra articulates a profound insight that there is no inherent and abiding self. Without an inherent self, something to rely on, an identity that's abiding, the body and mind are experienced as everything and boundless, an all-at-onceness that is fundamentally inclusive and free without an inherent self or identity to bind them. The Heart Sutra goes on to describe this boundlessness as kind of a freedom when one gets free of attachment to forms, that is, to the world and to things as they are. The Sutra lists numerous things that we get free of, among them feelings, perceptions, sight, sound, taste, touch, ignorance, and even old age and death. Now, whether one takes these freedoms literally and let's face it, Zen Buddhism resists literal and literalness. This idea of freedom can be quite attractive. Rather than emphasizing literalness or an analytical view of things, Zen, like some other Eastern practices, emphasizes direct experience. Rather than just talking about something, can you actually experience it? And that experience is often, most often achieved through the practice of meditation. So in this case, we are encouraged to explore emptiness or boundlessness through meditation. It can take quite a while to get there, but if we can, it can be quite freeing. Joseph Goldstein, in his book, Insight Meditation, has a beautiful analogy of experiencing emptiness. He writes, Imagine yourself dropping out of an airplane and free-falling for the first few minutes. Imagine a sense of exhilaration. But then you realize you do not have a parachute. So you panic as you fall through space, falling, 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 filled with terror that you do not have a parachute until a certain moment arises when you realize there is no ground. At that point of understanding, you just enjoy the ride. 
My own experience has not been quite like that. But I have been able to open just a little bit to that sense of emptiness or boundlessness in meditation. And with some practice, I've been able to reach a state where the sense of my body diminishes, that the boundary between my body and the rest of the room becomes round, around me, becomes kind of fuzzy and at times disappears. Occasionally, my sense of self diminishes, and I feel wondrously intermingled with what's around me, with all that is. These are rare but glorious experiences, and they've influenced how I carry myself in the world. Going a little deeper into this realm of emptiness or boundlessness, okay, and maybe becoming here a little bit more analytic, one encounters these, encounters these ideas of impermanence and dependent arising. Now, impermanence is, simply means that everything changes. Even things that seem permanent will ultimately fade away. We had a sense of this in our brief review of quantum mechanics. At a deep level, there are not permanent particles, but fields in constant motion. And at the level of our lives, we realize that change is all around us. Birth, death, ideas, civilizations, arising, disappearing. We know our whole world will one day be gone, then the sun too, and ultimately everything we see will fade to black. The better we are able to accept, to internalize this reality of impermanence, the less we will suffer as things do change around us. Now, dependent arising simply means that things are connected. I think Joan Halifax says it nicely. In this text, she is commenting on her work with dying people. She says, we see that space is boundless and without boundary. This is the wondrous freedom of openness. No hindrance, our natural freedom, the spirit and mind of inclusiveness. And our connection with all beings and things is boundless and without boundary as well. This is the wonder of our interdependence, how we live in a seamless world of connections. Indra's net, each jewel reflecting the light of all others, held together in a weave of space and connectivity. Our mind is boundless space. Our lives are boundless connections. Realizing this as you are dying could indeed be liberating. We saw hints of this idea again in our review of quantum mechanics, that everything is connected at some deep level in those fields and in the waves and the boundaries and the boundaries and divisions between things, between what is you and what is not you. These are all artifacts illusions. We also see this concept picked up in our seventh principle, which speaks of the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. I understand that when that seventh principle was being crafted, it originally spoke of the web of life. We were sort of in an environmental ethic at that time, but then it was broadened to include everything the web of all existence. And I think that is a wonderful clarification. Now there is an, another ancient text, sometimes called the precious mirror samadhi or the jewel mirror samadhi, writ written in the ninth century by Dongchen Langxi, who was a Chan Buddhist monk. It includes these lines, like facing a precious mirror, Form and reflection behold each other. You are not it, but in truth it is you. You are not it, but in truth it is you. Reverend James Ishmael Ford, who is both a Unitarian Universalist minister and a Zen Buddhist priest, writes about these lines. He says, on the spiritual way, at least as it's taught in Zen schools, 
we come to the loss of all our ideas about ourselves and the world. We tumble into the great empty. Then we find a reconstruction, a rebirth. It manifests first as nature itself, just the world, or rather the world and stars and all the great mess of the universe. Then we return as part of this great play of things. But we are old and we are new. We are the same as we've always been, caught up in our wounds and our longings. But the healing is also found, found as nothing other than the being we are. That is you. That is me. And so now we come to the end, the end of my humble exploration of what seemed to be such a simple idea, emptiness. I thank you for journeying with me, for exploring a bit of reality as we understand it, boundlessness, impermanence, dependent arising, and the interconnected web of existence. As an ending, we might return to the last part of the Heart Sutra, which offers a mantra, which is in Sanskrit. It reads, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhisattva. That great teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, translate, <laughs> translates this mantra at the closing of the Heart Sutra as this. Gone, gone, gone all the way over, Everyone gone to the other shore. Enlightenment. And thus, an ultimate emptiness. Gone. Everyone gone. Everyone gone over. Everyone awakened. Enlightenment. May it be so. This is the time in our service when we ask that you remember that we share our gifts here through pledging and donations. Instructions for payments to the fellowship are on a slide during the announcements um, before the service every week. And while you are considering your gifts to the fellowship, remember that each month LCUUF donates 5,000 pesos or more to an organization in our Lakeside community. We share one half of the offering collected at the fellowship each week with that organization. For the month of February, we'll be supporting Food Bank Lakeside. Food Bank Lakeside provides basic food security for families in our area and gave out 18,000 dispenses, bags of essential groceries to families in the last two years. Please donate to Share the Basket when you pay your pledge. Donate to Share the Basket separately or indicate what part of your donation is for Share the Basket. Let us extinguish our chalices with these words which we read together. We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts and share with all the world. Let me leave you with this final thought which is that the final mantra in the Heart Sutra speaks to a kind of a universalist concept, doesn't it? Which is a hope for everyone. Gone. Everyone gone over. Everyone getting free. Everyone awakened. Enlightenment. May it be so. <laughs>